Hello, and thanks for joining me. Today's lesson will be an introduction to calorimetry. If we look at the word calorimetry, the metry at the end is referring to measuring something. And so what are we measuring? Calories. Calories, that's the American way to measure heat. If it were in the metric system, it would be joulometry or something, because we'd measure joules instead. All right, so let's get right into this. now. This lesson will probably take, you know, a couple days before it really starts to sink in for you to understand the big idea. So don't be alarmed if it doesn't all make sense right from the beginning, okay? So let's talk about a very simple example. I, I want to use the term system and surroundings. So the system is whatever I'm studying. The surroundings is everything else. So in my system, I have a single unlit match, and it has a certain amount of stored or potential energy. And once I light that match, that's what we're going to do. So as that match lights, it loses potential energy. And at the end, when it goes out, it has less stored energy. Now, what did it do from going from high to low potential energy? It released energy to the surroundings, probably as heat. It gave off light as well, but generally heat is where it lost most of the energy. So the surroundings got warmer, and the system became less warm. Now, you might say, you mean colder? Well, yes, I mean colder, but cold doesn't exist. There's either hot or hotter or less hot, right? It's all relative. So heat is something that can move, not cold. What do we call it when something releases energy? Is that endo or exothermic? exothermic releases energy. Good. So let's look at a graphic here where we have the energy of the system before and the surroundings before the reaction before I lit the match. Then after I light the match <coughs> we notice that the surroundings have less energy and the system has more energy. Now does that make any sense to you? Well, it probably doesn't make sense in terms of lighting a match because if we lit the match, the system should have lost energy and the surroundings should have gained. So this is some other type of chemical reaction we're looking at. Okay, In this example, the energy of the system went up and the surroundings went down. Okay, But notice that the total energy from the beginning to the end is the same because of the law of conservation of energy. Energy can change forms, but it will never be lost. Now, this is an example of an endothermic reaction, not lighting of a match. Here, the reactants absorbed energy, and so then the product at the end is going to have a little bit more energy. Now look, if I put some numbers in here, like if I said the reactants had five units of energy and they gained 10 units of energy, that would be 15 units of energy on this side, which means the products would end up with 15 units of energy, or the system would increase in energy, which is what we're seeing. Let's try another example. In this case, here we are before the reaction. The reaction occurs, and now the system has less energy. So the system has released energy to the surroundings. This is an example, of course, of an exothermic reaction. So the energy of the reactant's products, see how they went from here down? They decreased. But the total energy is still the same. In this example, the reactants released energy to the surroundings. So it ended up here. So if I started with five units of energy and I release three, the products now have only two units of energy because the 2 plus 3 energy has to equal the 5 we start with. This is an example, again, of an exothermic reaction. So calorimetry is all going to be about heat moving from one source to another and keeping track of that. Now, I've got here a photograph of a glass, a beaker full of ice water. And if you look very carefully, put your eyes right up to the screen, you see it's right at 0 degrees Celsius. Now, as long as you have water and ice and it's at equilibrium, it will always be at zero degrees Celsius. 
Now, Q here refers to heat. If heat is going greater than zero, that means heat's going into the system, we call this an endothermic reaction. Now what would happen to a glass of ice water if you added heat into that system? Be careful, I heard somebody say the water will get warmer. No, not really. Temperature and heat aren't the same thing. When heat is added, energy is added, what we will accomplish is we will melt the ice. But the temperature will not go up. As long as you have ice and water, that temperature will remain exactly at zero degrees Celsius. Now on the other side, if the heat of the system is less than zero, meaning it's disappearing, heat's going out of the system, that's an exothermic process. And what's going to happen if the system, my beaker of ice water and cubes, loses heat, the temperature won't go down, but instead the liquid water will turn to solid ice. And not until it turns all one giant chunk of solid ice, then if you remove more heat, then the temperature will go down. So it's maybe not quite as simple as you thought in terms of heat and temperature. They mean something different, don't they? Now, I'm, I'm trying to show you that the system is what I'm looking at here. The surroundings is everything else. Melting is an example of an endothermic process. If you have solid water, ice, and you add heat, you will turn it from a solid to liquid water. And we call that melting. Clearly, melting is an endothermic process. Now, if you freeze water, that is an exothermic process. I know, your head is like, I never thought that. But think about it. You got liquid water changing to solid ice. Which has more energy, liquid water or ice? And the answer is, well, the liquid water if it's the same quantity. So therefore, to go from liquid to solid, you'd have to release heat, get rid of it, and that's an exothermic process. So freezing is an exothermic process. Now, oftentimes, if I just tell a student, um, you know, water's freezing, endothermic or exothermic, they'll say, well, freezing means cold, so it has to be losing heat. Well, you misunderstood what the term actually means. If you take the time to write out the chemical equation, think about which has more energy, the reactants or products, and then think about when you, which side the heat's going in on, melting it's going on in the reactant, freezing it's being released, then you can start to understand a little bit more clearly endothermic and exothermic. And finally, we don't use, you know, if, if we're gonna do this, we just simplify this and talk about heat going into the system is endothermic, heat leaving the system is exothermic. And the way we'll designate that, if it's going in, it'll have a positive value, and if it's going out, it will have a negative value. Now, you're somewhat familiar from maybe health class, food calories, right? We know you get food, you eat food, and there's proteins and carbs and fat, and hopefully you know that fat is a great source of energy. Might not be very good for you, but a great source of energy. So relative calories, you know, fat gives you about 9,000 calories per gram. These are science calories. When you talk about food calories, it's written with a capital C, not a lowercase c. So maybe in health class they told you fat's nine calories per gram, carbs and protein four calories per gram. So you do need to understand the difference between a science calorie written with a lowercase c and a food calorie written with a capital C. Usually when we do our calculations, we'll be dealing with the science calorie, but you can easily just move the decimals if you want to get to the food calorie. Now, in terms of calories, that's the American system, but the rest of the world uses joules. So here's the conversion. One calorie, that's a, a science calorie, is equal to 4.184 joules. That's a number that you'll get very used to seeing 
at 4.184 joules. Now, oftentimes, if we were meeting in class, we might do a little activity where you would take some metal and you'd put it in a beaker and then you'd boil the water and leave the beaker with the metal inside the water for several minutes. And we assume that the metal heats up to the temperature of the boiling water, 100 degrees Celsius. We then quickly dump it into this setup over here where there's a styrofoam cup with a little water in it. We dump the hot metal in it and put the lid on it and then we watch how much the water heats up. Now, it turns out things that have more heat will cause the water over here to heat up more. Things that have less heat will cause this to heat up less. That's a very simple experiment for determination of specific heat. Now this term is a new term for you, specific heat. It has to do with how much energy it takes to heat up a particular material. For instance, if you were to take and make a, a, a fire and then put rocks around the fire, Maybe you throw a, a pop can into the fire after you've drank whatever's in the can. And then you take a stick and you flick the aluminum can out of the fire. Within 30 seconds, you can pick that aluminum can up and it's relatively cool. Now, that's because it has a very low, what's called specific heat. It heats up very quick, but it also cools off very quick. Now, if you were to kick one of the rocks right next to the fire, away from the rock, away from the fire, and try to touch it, five minutes later, an hour later, that rock is still going to be very warm. Rock heats up incredibly slow, but it also cools off incredibly slow. Maybe you've experienced this. You go to the beach in the summertime on a hot sunny day, and you step on the, in the sand and you about burn your feet. You jump in the water and it feels, it feels kind of cool, doesn't it? And then later on that night, you, you go on the beach and you take your shoes off and you realize the sand is actually pretty cold. And you step in the water and it still feels relatively warm. Water has an unusually high specific heat. It heats up very slow, but once it's heated up, it stays warm for quite some time. So we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about specific heat or heat capacity in calorimetry. Um, I don't think we're going to do a, a coffee cup calorimetry experiment, but in very simple terms, you would take your hot object, you put it in the water, and then the heat from the hot object would transfer to the water, the water would warm up, and when the two reach thermal equilibrium, i.e. The, the temperature doesn't go up anymore in the thermometer, you know how much heat was transferred. Now, right now that probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but once we start looking at the problems, Go back to this diagram, it'll make more sense to you. Uh, in college, sometimes you get to use what's called a bomb calorimeter. It seems like it's pretty cool. It's actually not that cool. You take like a potato chip or something and you stick it in this little dish, right? Then this dish is put in a little steel box that you can then fill with pure oxygen. Then there is, you put that little box inside a bigger box. Now this whole box is only about one cubic foot. It's not very large. You then have water that you've measured out, the exact volume of water on the outside, and you have a thermometer that's probably four feet tall. It's very precise, down to the maybe thousandth of a degree, or even more precise, depending on which type you buy. It's very, very precise. So even small changes in temperature can be very precisely measured. Then, you, when you're ready, you hit a button and there's an ignition wire that causes that potato chip to burn up because it's around solid oxygen or supplied with oxygen. Then instead of this becoming like an ice cube, it becomes a heat cube. And the heat from that potato chip, the energy contained in the potato chip, is dissipated or goes into the water. And the temperature of the water goes up. The more calories that were in the food that you put in here, the higher the temperature will go up and then you can do a simple ratio to figure out how many calories that potato chip had. Now, this doesn't have to be done very often because we already know the, the caloric intake of fats, proteins, and carbs. But that's how you would use this. It might be useful if you're on, let's say, a submarine in the Navy and it's a nuclear 
uh, sub where you only come up every two months or three months because you need to figure out how much heat all the people are generating from their, their bodies because if you don't release that somehow, it's going to get quite uncomfortable in that submarine. All right, another diagram of that. I'm going to skip it. And um, in the next video, I'm going through the causes of change of calorimetry outline. And that will be um, somewhat useful for you to get the basics of the idea. I'm going to continue with my explanations for right now, but the next video will be the causes of change one. So let's talk about if you heat up a substance like ice. So if I take a big chunk of ice and I put it in, let's say a metal pan, I put it on the stove and turn it on, what's going to happen is it's going to look something like this. I'm going to get that very cold ice and it's going to heat up and as it warms up, warms up, warms up, warms up, it still remains a solid until we get to zero degrees Celsius, the melting point of water. At that point, the only thing I've been doing is adding kinetic energy, energy of motion, getting the molecules to move around, to vibrate next to each other as they warm up. At this point, I've got a big chunk of ice. If I continue to add heat, the temperature doesn't change. I'm going to repeat that. If I continue to add heat, the temperature doesn't change. It's called latent heat. It means that the heat is being added, and you'll see the effect maybe later. Right? In photography, if you shot with film, you would shoot pictures with the camera, and if you took the film out of the camera and looked at it, you, A, you would have ruined the film, but B, you would not have seen an image. It was called a latent image. It was there, but until you processed the film, you weren't going to see it. So when the latent heat is added, it causes not a change in kinetic energy, but a change in potential energy. And at that point, the ice melts. So here, it's a solid chunk of ice. Here, it's half ice, half water. Here, it's all water at zero degrees Celsius. On the graphing homework, you had to, a graph to explain similar to that. And some of you suggested that what I had done was stop heating. I didn't stop heating. There's a phase change occurring. Anytime you see a plateau on a heating curve, there's a phase change happening. Here we're going from solid to liquid. That's this plateau. And then this is all liquid water heating up. And this is a phase change. And this is gas. So the second plateau is where the water changes from a liquid to a gas. And it boils away. So we can sort of see this pattern. And that's what all heating curves are going to look like. Now, if the sample sublimes, it's only going to have one plateau as it goes from a solid, and then it changes to a gas. But we're not going to deal with that in this class. Notice also that anytime you're going up the mountain, up the hill, that's a change in kinetic energy, a change in temperature. But when you're doing a horizontal move, that's a change in potential energy. Okay, Not a change in temperature, but potential energy. Even though we're adding heat, the temperature doesn't change. So when there is a temperature change, there's a change in the kinetic energy, the molecular motion of the molecules. Now, how much of a temperature change you're going to experience? Well, that depends on the heat capacity. right? Metals will heat up quite a bit if you add a little bit of heat, where water will change its temperature very little if you add the same amount of heat. So that's the concept of heat capacity. Heat capacity, by definition, is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of that substance by one degree Celsius. Now, it turns out to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius takes one calorie. That's pretty cool. Or 4.184 joules of energy. Water is selected because it's a very common medium and it has an incredibly high heat capacity due to its hydrogen bonding. You don't need to know why at this point, but water takes a lot of energy to heat up as compared to something like a piece of metal. It heats up very quickly. All right, on our phase change, it was called a phase change because we had solids at the bottom, then after the plateau, liquids, and then after the second plateau, gases. So solid, liquid, and gases. Those are the phases. During a phase change, 
the only thing you're changing is the potential energy. It's going from maybe a solid to a liquid, but if the temperature remains constant. And in those points, we're thinking about what's called the heat of fusion. Now, if you want to think of H meaning heat, that's okay. It actually refers to the state function enthalpy. Uh, but for our class, if we want to think of it as heat, that's okay. So think about fusion as melting two things together. Well, however much energy it took to melt them together, law of conservation of energy says when they come apart is how much energy it's going to take to remove them or reverse that amount. So the amounts of energy are the same. So heat of fusion is how much energy it takes to melt one gram of substance when it's at its melting point. And, and I'll give you those values here in a little bit. So on a heating curve, we also have that second plateau, the heat of vaporization. And that's how much energy it takes to boil one gram of substance at its boiling point. And it's usually quite a bit larger than the heat of fusion. Right? It takes a lot more energy to, let's just think about it, to boil water than to maybe melt an ice cube. Right? Um, all right, let's keep moving. I'm not going to worry about those examples. Uh, I'm just kind of showing you here's that heat of fusion, that first plateau. Here's the heat of vaporization, the second plateau. Everything between here and down here, this region right here, is in the liquid state. Everything from here and above is a gas, and everything below this first plateau down here is a solid. That's why we call it a phase diagram. All right. I think we need some humor, so it's not great, but it's an attempt. A small piece of ice which lived in a test tube fell in love with a Bunsen burner, of all things. Bunsen, my flame, I melt whenever I see you, said the ice. The Bunsen burner replied, it's just a phase you're going through. Unfortunately, that's the entire joke, right? Not that funny, but we'll go for it. All right. Now, this part you want to pay attention to. Let's, let's draw out a phase diagram kind of slowly and think about it. So we, you're imagining a big block of ice put in a pan and I put it on the stove and I turn the stove on and I never turn the stove off and then I record the temperature of whatever's in that pan. So it starts off, I had some very cold ice, about minus 80, and as I add heat, I add heat, I add heat, the temperature goes up and it goes up at a constant rate. We're going to learn that that's going to be the heat capacity for that particular material. When I get to, and let's, let's label this, going from A to B, I am warming the ice. That's all I'm doing. Now, the equation for calculating how much energy to use is given right here. Now, heat is equal to, nowadays I change this around a little bit, because a lot of you want to, you think you might want to become doctors, and you got to take the MCAT, right? The MCAT, that's the test to get into medical school. Can you see M, C, and this looks like A, T, M, C, A, T? It almost looks like MCAT, doesn't it? Okay, so the M here refers to mass. Does it make sense that if I double the amount of mass, I'd have to double the amount of heat to cut that same temperature change? Yeah. Does it make sense that the bigger change in temperature. This is not an A, this is a delta. It means change in temperature. Final temperature minus initial. The bigger change in temperature is always going to take more energy. Smaller change in temperature, less heat. That makes sense. And finally, Cp is the specific heat of the material I'm looking at, in this case the solid. So this is a constant. That's why it has the, the designation C, because it's a constant. All right, and if you were wondering, the specific heat of ice, it takes 2.077 joules per gram degree Celsius to melt ice, excuse me, to warm ice one degree per gram that you have. All right, next, notice that we're at zero. That's the melting point of ice. Going from B to C, I'm still heating up that chunk of ice, but this time, What's happening there is the ice is melting, changing from a solid to a liquid, but the temperature doesn't change. Now, the formula for that 
is just heat equals mass times heat of fusion. This is another constant. The heat of fusion for ice is 333 joules per gram. There is no change in temperature. Don't put zero in here because zero times anything would be zero. Okay. So anytime we're climbing the hill, we use MCAT, MCP delta T. If instead we're doing a heat of fusion or heat of vaporization, the second plateau, we're going to use simply heat equals mass times either C fusion, heat of fusion, or C vape, heat of vaporization. Next, we continue to heat and we notice now the water increases in temperature. Going from C to D, we are warming the water, still adding heat. Now because we're on a slope, the equation for that is going to be our MCAT, MCP delta T. The order doesn't matter. This time though, the specific heat of liquid water is different than the specific heat of solid water. The, the, the specific heat, excuse me, of liquid water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Right? That's the same as one calorie, isn't it? 4.184 joules. That's how much energy it takes to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius. 4.184 joules. Now, if we were to continue to heat up our water once it gets to 100 degrees Celsius, it won't get any hotter. All we'll do is boil the water away out of our pan. So going from D to E, we are boiling the water, changing it from a liquid to a gas. Because we're on a plateau, we're not going to use MCAT. Instead, heat is mass times heat of vaporization, CVAP. And that constant is 2,256 joules per gram. So you can see it takes a lot of energy to boil water, where if you're simply melting ice, it's quite a bit less energy, isn't it? Okay. Now, at this point, if we had done this as an experiment, our pan would be bone dry. There would be no more water left in the pan. It's all evaporated. If, though, I did this in a, maybe a pressure cooker or I put a lid on it, I could superheat the steam. And so that's what I've done here going from E to F. I've somehow trapped that steam and heated it up. So E to F, we're causing that steam, we're, we're, we're changing that liquid water into gas and heating it up a little bit further at that point. Okay? And because we're on a slope, that's an MCAT. So mass times change in temperature times the constant for the specific heat of the gas. For water, it has a constant of about 2.042 joules per gram degree Celsius. This diagram is going to be very, very useful for you as you start doing your problems with calorimetry. Okay? So you want to make sure you either print that out or do a screen capture or something so you have that diagram. All right, um, I'm going to skip this one for right now, and let's let's go some basics. Let's go. Let's take a step back, and let's see if we can develop this a little bit further. And then I'll I'll stop, and then we'll do the cause of change lecture outline for you. Which after you watch that, then I think this stuff's going to start to make more sense. So let's do a little thought experiment. All right. So we got equal ma masses of hot and cold water in this little block and no heat is going to be lost to the surroundings. And I've got a little divider there. Now, if we could put on a little Miss Frizzle glasses, which of these water molecules are moving faster, the hot or the cold? In other words, which has more kinetic energy? Well, the hot, of course. So if we could look at that, these little lines, these little tails are called vectors. They're basically like I took a picture and this water molecule went from here all the way down to here, where this one only went from here to here. These are moving faster. Now, if I have water at 90 degrees and 10 degrees, and I pull that divider out, and I let thermal equilibrium occur, what do you think the final temperature will be of the water? If you said 50 degrees Celsius, you're correct. Because you had 90 degrees and 10 degrees, that's 100 degrees, but half of the heat went here and half went here. And that's exactly what you would get. 
That's not a difficult concept, is it? Things go from hot to cold until they reach thermal equilibrium. Well, let's try this little game here and let's see if this works. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to mislead you a little bit. Um, and what I show you initially won't work for what we're doing, but it's logical. That's why I want to show it to you. So let's assume I have a system and surroundings. No heat's going from the system to the surroundings. I have two blocks of aluminum. They both weigh 20 grams. This one's at 40 degrees Celsius. This is at 20 degrees Celsius. Now, if I allow those two aluminum blocks to come into contact, what will be the final temperature of those two blocks? If you said 30 degrees Celsius, I think I agree with you. All right? Now, if we did that as an experiment, 30 degrees Celsius is indeed the temperature you would get. Now, I don't know how you did that. You could have done this. You could have taken the mass, 20 grams, times the temperature, 40 degrees Celsius, plus the mass of this one, 20, degree, 20 grams times 20 degrees Celsius, and divided by the sum of the masses, and you'd get 30 degrees Celsius. Or you could have said, well, it's halfway between the two. Either way, 30 degrees Celsius is correct. All right, let's try another one. Now this time, I've got two different size aluminum blocks. This one weighs 20 grams, it's at 40 degrees Celsius, and this one is 10 grams at 20. When I allow, when I allow those to get together, are they still going to end at 30 degrees Celsius? Notice that this one was a lot bigger than this one. No, they're not going to end at 30. Will they be closer to the 40 or the 20? The 40, won't they? Because it's a little bit bigger. Now, if we did the math like we did before, right? Mass times temperature plus mass times temperature divided by the sum of the masses, we get 33.3 degrees. And that is the answer to this question. Let's try another one. This time, I've got the two blocks, but this time the smaller mass has the higher temperature than the bigger mass. When they get together, are they going to be at 30 degrees Celsius? No. 33? No. Are they going to be closer to the, what do you think they're going to be? To the 40 or the 20? Yeah, they'll be closer to the 20. It turns out if you do the math, they'll be about 26.7 degrees. That's what, that would be the answer. Now, let's try another one. This time, I've got a little block of silver. It's at 100 degrees Celsius, 30 grams, and I'm going to drop it into this water that's at room temperature, 75 mils of water. And when I drop it in, I want to know what's the final temperature. Now, if we've done what we've done up to this point, which is take the mass times the temperature plus the mass times the temperature divided by the sum of the masses, you get 46 degrees Celsius. And you feel pretty good about that. But if you want the lab, you find out the real answer is 26.6 degrees Celsius. So the question is, what the heck is going on? Why is that? Hmm. That's a tough one. Remember in the first examples and all the examples I gave you, it was always the same two materials? It was aluminum and aluminum, or water and water. Well, this was silver and water. Do you remember that idea of heat capacity, that some things heat up quick and cool off slow? Right? Different materials heat up and cool off at different rates. So if, if you're assuming all materials transfer heat equally well, you're going to miss the question. So we have to understand specific heat or heat capacity. Water and silver simply do not transfer heat the same way. Water has a specific heat of 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Silver has a specific heat of 0 0.235 joules per gram degree Celsius. That means if I add 4.184 joules of energy to a gram of water, it will change 1 degree Celsius. If I add 4.184 joules of energy to 1 gram of silver, It'll change a lot more than that, won't it? It'll change like 16 degrees, right? Because it's like how many times bigger? Huge amount, okay? So look, it takes this amount of energy to heat one gram of water one degree Celsius. 
it only takes 0.235 joules of energy to heat one gram of silver that amount. And however much heat the silver loses is how much the water gained. And because the silver cools off very quick, it releases very little energy. And so the water doesn't go up maybe as far as you would have thought temperature increase. That's due to the law of conservation of energy. In, in this situation, one is going to lose energy, that is the one that was hot, the silver, and the other gains energy, that's the water. So the silver's hot, the water's cold, relative. So it means our water's going to heat up pretty slowly, and it would take a lot of energy to get that to happen. Whereas the silver is going to cool off real quick, but it doesn't have to release very much energy because it didn't take much energy to get hot. So let's look at some of the, the math related to this. All right, let me skip that for right now. You will be given tables and values for specific heats. Okay, now this value for water might look a little bit different than what I gave you on the sheet. So I'll tell you which one I want you to use. Depending on which source you use, you'll get slightly different answers. Um, Water is a very large value compared to, look at copper and gold and iron and mercury and lead. Metals are very low specific heat values. Okay. Um, I think what I'm going to do is pause right here. I'm going to stop. I'm going to have us, then I'm going to record the cause of change lecture outline, have you watch that. And then if you rewatch this video, it's going to make a lot more sense to you. First time through, this stuff is tough. Okay. So I, I don't expect that you got it all figured out by any means right now. So take your time. You'll get it figured out. I'll talk to you a little bit.